Thank you for joining us today. Here's what's going on at El Dorado Church. February is all about returning to our first love. So this month, let's be intentional and spend time both ourselves and with our family on focusing on God's love and His goodness. Let's focus on how much we love God because He first loved us. On Sunday, February 14th, we're going to be here at church celebrating our first love. And this February 14th on Valentine's Day, we have a very special speaker coming in, a pastor and leader of ministry to give us a great message. Plus, you're going to want to come early because we are going to have a sweet surprise for everyone, both at our 9 and 11 o'clock service. We'll see you there on Valentine's Day. Mark your calendars for our next prayer night on Wednesday, February 17th. You won't want to miss this one. It's such a special night of worship and prayer where we all can come together. But for those of you that need to stay home, don't worry because we will be live streaming it as well as having options to send your prayer requests and anything that God puts on your heart. So again, join us for prayer night on Wednesday, February 17th. We'll see you there. We are really excited to be reaching so many people through our live stream, and this is just the beginning. And we want you to join our very important tech team. If you're an audiovisual expert or have no experience at all, no worries. We're going to have our very first tech training day on Saturday, February 6th. So if you're interested in joining the team, email us at info at eldoradochurch.org and let us know. Can't wait to have you a part of this very important team. Be blessed, El Dorado Church family. And as always, you can stay up to date by jumping on the website at eldoradochurch.org. Well, good morning, everybody. How many of you needed a little extra time in the presence of the Lord this morning? I know I did. Um, it's great to see you all. Uh, good morning. We're glad you're here. Welcome new friends and old friends. Uh, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to 2 Corinthians Four. Let's open our books and 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 um, this may come as a surprise to some of you, but friends, wait for it. Here's here's a big one. Ready? Life is hard. Yes. Hold back your applause for that revelation. Life is hard, isn't it? This is what we're talking about today. Life can be hard. Things don't go exactly how we want them to go. We pray, we pray, we will it, we believe it, we pray. And has you, have you noticed? Things don't always go the way we think they're going to, the way we expect them to. Things can go south. And many folks, after loss, after a major setback, after a bit of, uh, 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 of pain, we can actually... Uh, the nature, uh, human nature is to retreat, to turn inward, to become even more isolated, and to become, fundamentally, we basically give up on life. We just exist. No longer do we live in the fullness anymore. It's almost like we're not living anymore. But then again, there's some other people that it's amazing. No matter what life hits them with, no matter what they run into, they just seem to shake it off. Whatever life throws at them, no matter how bad, they get right back up again and get back in the game. They always seem to bounce back. And the Apostle Paul was like that. He was one of those resilient characters that we see in the Bible, that we, we see around us sometimes. He had this amazing ability, no matter what life threw at him, to get back up again. He didn't give up. 2 Corinthians 4, 8, 9, Paul explains how he sees the world. He says, we're pressed on every side by troubles, but not crushed and broken. We're perplexed because we don't know why things happen as they do. But we don't quit. We don't give up. We are hunted down, but God never abandons us. We get knocked down, but we get up again, and we keep going. We get knocked down, but we get up again, don't we? Where do you get that kind of resilience? <laughs> Where? Where do we find that sort of keep goingness? If you want to know what that is, I, I want that, 
And I want you to have that kind of resilience, that kind of courage where every bone in your body is, is, is saying, no, stop, quit, give up. Every fiber of your being says, I can't go a step further. And yet, you get up. You say, I'm going to get up. Because what happens is if you, if, if you, if you succumb to that, I'm just going to build a wall. I'm not going to let the pain in anymore. I've had enough. I'm just going to build that wall. If you build that wall to keep out the pain, guess what? You also keep out the love. You also keep out the beauty of life. And this morning, I want to talk about how we can just stop existing and we could begin living lives that are fully alive. You know, the glory of God is a man fully alive, a woman fully alive. The oldest book in the Bible, it's a good place to find wisdom in the oldest book, and that's the book of Job. We're going to talk about old Job today. You know the story of Job. He was the wealthiest man in the world there. He was eminent man. He was a respected man. He was a man of influence. Extremely, in, and on a single day, this great man, this man, in a single 24 hour period, this man lost it all. Everything his cattle, his sheep, his goats, terrorists killed all his children. And to make it worse, on top of that, I know some of us can relate to sickness, this man got a, a chronic, terminal, painful illness. You think you had a bad day, huh? This was a 24-hour period. Job had a gold medal. He got a gold medal in pain. He got a platinum. He got a purple heart in crisis. Friends, no matter what you're going through, and I don't know what you're going through, and I don't want to minimize it. I don't want you to feel like I'm belittling what you're going through, but it ain't nothing compared to what Job went through in a single day. Nothing compared to what he was forced to endure. And I think that we can, well, I know that we can glean some lessons from this man and how he dealt with this. There's some compelling things we can do. Because when you want to give up, when you want to say, I don't have the energy to go one more step. I'm going to quit. I'm going to quit on my marriage. She doesn't even know it, but I've had it. I'm going to quit on my marriage. I'm going to quit on my job. I'm sick of this. I'm, gonna, I'm just about to give up on my dreams once in a I'm done with my health pushing in. I, I don't know what I'm going to do. If you'll do what Job did, you'll make it through. Let's look at five things this morning that Job did that enabled him to not only survive, but to find the courage to keep going when things got really, 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 really tough. When dreams are dashed, when we're disappointed, when major loss and calamity comes into our lives, the first thing that we need to do is to tell God. We need to openly, precisely, and exactly, we need to tell God exactly what we're feeling. Unload our feelings. Release all our frustrations. One precious woman said to us, said to me a couple weeks ago, I didn't know I could tell him that too. You just need to tell it to God. He's big enough to take it. Amen. Did you know that when you trust your negative emotions with the Lord, it's actually an act of worship? It, 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 it's, it's an act of worship to, to be barren through and say, I praise you, Lord. You're great. That's important too. But he's not so proper that you can only bring him bows and curtsies. You can bring him skin knees and festering wounds. He's that kind of God. He can take it. What's going on here with Job is that he physically and openly expressed his pain to God. And he stands here. It says he tears his robe. You got to be pretty upset to rip your clothes off here. And grief, he does this. He has grief. He shaves his head and he falls on the ground and he worships it's an act of humility. And there's four emotions that we all go through when we're confronted with extreme loss, when we're confronted with tragedy, with, 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 with fear, with anxiety, with isolation, with pandemics. There's all these types of emotions that happen to us when we think we're going to win and we lose. Anytime you go through, and I'm not talking about denial. That's in there too. I'm talking about four other emotions. I'm talking about anger. The first is anger. One of our meekest, yeah, one of our meekest, far from weakest men in our men's ministry said to me recently, I'm angry. I'm just angry. 
we were all shocked how honest he was. Anger is a natural reaction. Anger is real and anger has power. Number two, you're going to have to have a little grief. You say, what have I lost? What have we lost here? Are we losing it all? Third, you're going to have shock. What do I do now? And the fourth, fear, fear of the future, fear of how, how far could this thing take us down the drain? What's going to happen next? And these things are, are hitting us hard. And, and if you don't express them, they're going to cause you to explode in some way. But you can't just dump it on your wife or your husband because they get their ears get tired of that. You got to express them somewhere, though. And so the first thing you need to do is tell him, point one, tell him, express it, don't repress it. Confess to God, tell him fully, exactly. Here's what I feel. I can't take it, God. He's not going to be mad at you. God can handle your anger. He can handle your frustration. I've told you before, he can handle all of your emotions. Do you know why? Because he is an emotional God. He's a living God. Open your Bible. It says he's grieved. He's angered. God has feelings. Did you know he has feelings? God has sadness. God gets angry. And he understands all these things because he made you in his image. He doesn't just want you to make pancakes and bring it to him. He wants you to be in relationship with him. God is big enough to handle your anger, ladies. God's not afraid of your fear, men. God is greater, God is stronger than the weight of all my emotions, you see? And it's okay to tell him how you feel. When you've been betrayed, when you've been rejected, when someone you love has been taken away from you, you've lost your job, you've lost your future, it appears, and you're upset, and you're frustrated, and you don't know what's next. Listen, God can handle your complaints. He can handle your questions. He can handle your doubt. Because God's love for you is bigger than all your fears and all your emotions. That's what we love most about Job, is that he's flat out, dead on, real with God. He's, he, he's brutally honest. Our buddy Job here, he doesn't mince words. Look at Job 7.11. When he'd lost it all in one day, and this ought to give you some permission to be real before the living God. Job says, no, I can't be quiet. I'm angry and bitter. I have to speak, he says. He says, if I don't speak, I'm gonna explode. When you swallow your negative emotions, it's going to take it out on your body later. You got to take it to God. When you're angry, when you're upset, it's like shaking up a pop bottle, a soda bottle, those of you that aren't from Ohio, shaking up a soda bottle and nothing, not, you don't let it out. If, if you try to do that, it's going to show up somewhere else in your life six months down the line in, in some behavior, some addiction, some compulsion, some sort of uh, destru- self-destructive behavior it's going to find a way, this pain, to express itself in another way, unless I give it to God. Job tells us, I'm angry. I'm bitter, Lord. I've got to speak. And what does God do? <gasps> oh my gosh, my dear. What? Of course not. God's not a British maid. God is saying, I can absorb it. Bring it on. You're just like that little blonde banging on King Kong's chest. You're not hurting him. Ah! God can take it. All right, church, the right response to tragedy that is unexplained in our life is not just to grin and bear it. Your prayers aren't just limited. Your prayers aren't just limited to praise your Lord. No, God wants you to be authentic with him. He wants you to be honest. When my daughter, who loves when I preach about her, when my daughter over there doubts my wisdom, yes, Sometimes she's that naive. When she doubts my wisdom in her life, you know what? I would rather have her come to me respectfully and say honestly, Daddy, I don't like the way, I don't agree. I don't feel, that doesn't feel right. I'd rather have her be honest than stuff it down. At the end of the conversation, I'm still going to be right, Abigail. But I still want to hear, I want to hear her heart. 
I'd much rather be in relationship with her than have her just stomp off. She can stomp off after we talk. I'd rather have an honest gut level conversation because relationship is first, I love her. And she may not understand why she's being directed in a different way yet. We can't understand it, but God wants us to wrestle with him. In the book of, we see in Genesis that Jacob wrestled with the Lord, didn't he? And, and God would rather have you wrestle with him than just, than just hide your feelings because he already knows what you feel. And so you're burning up inside and, and God would rather, look, 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 when you wrestle with somebody, it's a contact sport. It's straightforward, it's upfront. This is what Jesus is looking for. So many people say, I wanna see miracles in my life. I wanna see God move in the supernatural, but you won't even give him your natural. Man, hashtag guy can tell her right there. Thank you, Lord, you get the hashtag. We, we want the supernatural, but we won't give him our natural. Man, God would rather have you wrestle with him so it's interesting to me in Lamentations, because you know we always need a scripture to back up what the Lord says anyway. Here it is, Lamentations, which means wah, to lament. 2.19 says this, arise, means get up, cry out in the night as the watches of the night begin. Pour out your heart like water in the presence of the Lord. When was the last time you cried out in the middle of the night? When was the last time you poured out your heart like water before God, before the invisible God, you spoke into that invisible chaos? Help me! Ugh. Well, that just wouldn't be proper. Yeah, but it would be delivering. It would be music to his ears. In the Bible, there's many instances of godly people sharing these frustrations. God can handle it. Jeremiah once said, God, you deceived me. Woo! He's called God a liar. Jeremiah had a pretty good relationship with God, didn't he? What he was saying is, I, I, you prom I think you promised me something here, but this happened. And then God struck Jeremiah dead. That's not what it says. God handled it. David said, I've taken your worst. You can hand out, God. I'm fed up. That's it. That's it. But he always came back. God had real relationships with these people. I think sometimes we see these Bible figures as being so special when I see them as just having the audacity to take God at his word and believe that he loves you enough that you can talk to him. Amen. Howard, our men's minister, when he needs or wants to talk to me about something, he has the audacity to say, would you have lunch with me? And what's funny is, you know, when I'm there to minister to Howard, who do you think it's ministered to? When I take out some time on, on a Friday to spend time with my daughter, take her on a date, you know, for her own good, to, so that she'll, it, it fills yeah. up the papa to spend time with you. You're not like, if your grandkid runs to you and has all this emotion, grandpa, and kicks, you're, you're not afraid of that. You're, you're endeared to that child. Come here. I know. I, God understands what it feels like. Naomi says one time, uh, call me bitter because, she said, be God, because my life is bitter. But she came around. God is okay with us telling him the truth. The same thing is here with Job. Although he questioned God's wisdom, although his mouth spouted out about frustration, Job still finds his root in life by trusting God. That's what we're going to see. The first step then, first step we've got to do is get it out. Amen. You'll like these five points. I, I do this thing in sermons, FYI. The first point's always the longest when it comes to five, and then you'll, you'll feel like time's going by fast. It's kind of something like, first point is you got to get it out tell God. Second thing you got to do is when you feel like giving up, you need the power and the courage to accept help. I researched this. I, I put it all together for you guys. I know you needed to hear this today, especially this one. When we get hurt, what we want to do is we want to just hide and not let anybody in like a wounded animal, but most of it's pride. And, and, and we, we don't let others come alongside us. You need to accept help from God, loner. 
Because God doesn't intend for you to handle all that pain, all that loss, you, you, all, that, all that stress alone. You know, you, we grow when we let other people help us, when we show our vulnerability. The Bible says in the very beginning, it says it is not good for man to be alone in Genesis. We're made, we're wired for a relationship. And here's the problem. When you and I go through major disappointment, the natural reaction is to isolate. I'll just handle it myself. It's a bad idea. You need friends. That's why we have life groups. That's why we have fellowship before and after service. June has a life group on Tuesday mornings. Robin has one. We have several others. If you need to get connected Wednesday morning, okay, she moved it. I No, it moved in my mind. Is it Wednesdays? Wednesday. Yeah, okay, Wednesdays. But you need friends at that point. Whenever you feel this way, look, look, look what God says. You think God's worried about you losing a little faith? Look at Job 6, 14. He says a person, any persons in here, a person, a person's friends should be kind to him when he's in trouble. Even if he stops fearing God, Lynn gets really PO'd and he's like, I don't even, he's turned his back on God. Well, that's when I turn my back on him right? That's not what it says. It says, Lynn, let me pray with you, man. I'll believe for you. I'll believe for you. When desperate people give up on God Almighty, their friends should stick with them. I should be able to go to Lynn and say, I'm having a hard time, man, with this. Well, well, let, me, let, me, let me believe for you, brother. We'll believe God right now. We'll trust God for each other in this moment. A person's friend should be kind, even if he stops fearing the Almighty. Wow. God cares so much about us. He's like, man, you can doubt me. It won't hurt me. But just, just let your friend pray for you. Encourage each other. That's a command in Thessalonians. And I love this one. By helping each other with your troubles, the Bible says we obey the law of Christ. Love thy neighbor is not something that we just like on our phones. Yeah, I like love our neighbor. I, I don't know. A thumbs up isn't the same thing as... Uh, when someone's doubting, when someone's frustrated, when someone's full of fear, you go along and say, it's okay, I'm gonna believe God for you, but I'm gonna lift you up. He says that is when we're fulfilling the law of Christ. Pain is rich or poor, uh, old or young, we all have pain, and, and, and we need each other. We're here to help each other through pain. So number one, God tells us, tell me how you feel. Number two, take help from others. Number three, see, it's getting faster. The third thing you need to do is stop asking, why? Why? Pastor Nancy Cole told me, <laughs> it's the booby prize. She goes, Pastor Guy, stop asking why. That's the booby prize. I think she's in her 80s. I'm sorry, you look so good if you're listening, Pastor Nancy. She's 70s. She's going to kill me. But she's beautiful. She's a redhead, and she's on it. She's like, that's the booby prize. Move on. Don't ask why. She says it, and she's right, because the third thing you need to do is stop. Why? Because it only prolongs the pain. Because here's the misconception. We think if we just understood why, then it would make everything okay. But you don't need an explanation. You need a savior. And that, our, our brains don't need a why. That, that wouldn't, help. well, because people are mean. Does that help you? Or whatever it is because it's all about money, whatever the, the why is it gonna help you? Actually, I'm doing this so that people can see, I mean, I'm allowing you to suffer so that I can, you don't know what God's reason is. And you know what? We gotta stop. Job had to learn this. And he asked these questions for 37 chapters. Why? And he couldn't get away from it. Now, I told you, you're allowed to say that. There's a time for that, and you should. But there comes a time when you need to listen again. And here's what's going on. Job asked these kinds of questions. Why, Job 3.11, why didn't I die at birth as I came from the womb? Why did my mother let me live? Why did she nurse, why did she even nurse me at her, at her breast? In other words, he's saying, I'm in so much pain, it would have been better that I wasn't born. Why? Why did I just say Pastor Nancy was 80? She's gonna kill me. <laughs> She just has a lot of wisdom. But he asked, Job asked this. He actually said, I rue the day that I was born. Look at Job 3.20. Look at this kind of question. Why let people go on living in misery? 
Why give light to those in grief? So he said, it's almost like that last line, it's like almost like God's the light is a carrot and he's like, come on, come on. He's saying, why do you keep picking me up when you're just gonna let me fall again? You gotta be in some pain to talk to God like this, but it's actually a legitimate question, isn't it? Isn't it? It's a why question, it's human nature. And, and, and we believe that it will help us, but we don't need an explanation, we need God. We need comfort and support that only comes through Him. The kind of stuff that you receive when you're there in worship. You know what he says? He says, I'm gonna give you the peace. Who wants peace? That passes understanding. Passes it. So, so like, here's understanding. Where's the peace? Oh, on the other side of the understanding. It means I don't, I'm looking in the wrong place. We're always looking for why. Why'd that person walk out of me? Why'd they hurt me? Why'd I lose my job? Why did she, she betray me? He betrayed me. Why did my loved one get sick? Why did I get that way? Why? I want to say after seeking the why for 25 years, I'm going to give you my profound educated answer. I don't know. And neither do you because you're not God. And God doesn't have to check in with you. If we just... Yes, dad, life will go a lot easier because I'm not God and you're not either. And some things we're never gonna understand until we get on the other side of glory, until we get to heaven and, and everything will become crystal clear there. Only God knows. Let me show you a couple very important verses. Proverbs 25, it won't be on the screen, says it is God's privilege to conceal a thing, to conceal a thing. But it also says that God reveals things. You wouldn't know anything about God if he didn't reveal it to you. He's revealed himself to you. He's revealed himself to you through nature. How many of you have been on a hike and you're like, oh God. Scripture and through circumstances, he will show himself to you. But it also says here that it is God's privilege, his priority, it's my prerogative to conceal things. That means to hide them. And what the thing is, is that God does that. He's chosen to conceal things because why? So we'll trust him. Instead of learning to trust our feelings only, we can live by faith also because you couldn't handle it. It'd scare you to death if you could see what's coming. Not because not it's always terrible, because it's so glorious, your head would explode. God intentionally conceals the Bible, a uh, matter the Bible says, because we're only gonna find out on the other side of eternity. And so we've gotta stop asking why. We need to get a little file, an ask later file, and put everything in there. Look at 1 Corinthians 13. I'm gonna show you in the message. First, I wanna read it here. He encourages us, even though he doesn't tell us everything. He, he says through Paul, right now, right now, right now, we only know a little. We just know partially, in other words. Right now we see things imperfectly, as in a poor mirror. But then, in other words, in heaven, we'll see everything with perfect clarity. Clarity. And that I know, and all that I know now is partial and incomplete, but then in heaven I will know everything. Look at, look at, look at the message. We don't yet see things clearly. Not yet. We're squinting in a fog, peering through a mist, and we're thinking that's reality, but we're just, we're in a fog and, and it won't be long before the weather clears and the sun shines brightly. We'll see it all then. See it all as clearly as God sees us, knowing him directly, just as he knows us. I, I love this because that last line, it just assumes what you need to realize. He knows you. He knows the problem that you think is too big for him. He already is in, you don't know him and you don't know how good he is, but he already knows you. That equation is done. It's you that are learning about him and he'll reveal to you what you need when you need it. To me, that's a bit of a um, relief. Not at first because I, I need to know because then I can relax. Because the more I know, the more relaxed I am, right? As they reveal more deep state, you become more and more relaxed. Just you're like a dog looking for a bone, you know? And all you get is dirty paws? <laughs> Truly, friends, our brain capacity cannot handle. We need an Ask God Later file and park stuff there. 
And that's the only way we're going to find our joy. Every time you get one of those unanswerable questions, put it in that ask later file and let Jesus live with you today. You know, sometimes I'll pray about something so hard, so badly I want it, and it doesn't work out. And when it doesn't work out, we're, very, we're tempted in that moment to doubt God, to doubt his promises, to even doubt, uh, doubt the um, power, the validity, the eff- efficacy of prayer. We even say, well, what's the point of praying? He already knows and he didn't do it. There's no value in this. Listen, that's perfectly normal to feel like that. Even Job doubted the efficacy of prayer. Look at Job 21, 15. Who is the almighty and why should we obey him? This is someone who's in pain. What good will it do if we pray? He's saying, what good is it if I even pray? And so we make this illogical jump when God doesn't answer our prayers exactly the way we want him to. Well, God just doesn't love me. You're wrong. God loves you so much. He loves you so much. He knows what answer you need. We're always getting in trouble when we start doubting God's love for us. We've been, once we do that, we, we're not seeing things rightly. So we need to, um, what we need to do instead is point four here. Trust God, even with what I don't understand. I don't know how to communicate this, but when I finally get done with all that reeling and rolling, and I go, oh, I just need to trust God, there's a relief that comes. It's just a relief that comes. You're like, yeah, but, but I, for some reason, I have to kind of go through that. And then I finally go, oh, I can't figure, I'm hitting my head against the wall, and I go, oh, yeah, I can just trust God. And I just dropped that bone. Just let it go. Because he gives me the, pa- the peace that passes understanding. I'm not going to find the answer, so I just trust God. And God always, always, always answers prayer, always. Sometimes he answers with yes. Sometimes he answers with no. Sometimes he answers with not yet or wait. Sometimes he answers with you're kidding me, right? And then other times he answers, this is my favorite. Okay, guy, you be the answer. Oh, thanks, God. And other times he says yes. And more than often I find he says, trust me. There's a lot of different ways he answers prayer. And for 37 chapters, Job in this book is asking questions. Why is this happening to me? Why are you allowing all this pain, this confusion? Why haven't you answered my prayers? Why, why, why? And then finally in chapter In chapter 38, Job stops, I almost called him Job, Job stops asking why. Why? And and God says, hang on, Job, I'd like to ask you a few questions. Because Job's like way out here, like I am on this platform, just hanging way out here in the wrong place. Why, why? And God wants to put him back in his seat so that he can begin to move. And so God floods him with some questions, like questions only God can answer, like uh, where were you? when I made the universe, huh? I always think God's kind of Italian in this place. (laughs) Can you explain the laws of gravity to me? Do you understand why the sun is hot, Job? And for two chapters, God asks questions. And And soon Job realizes after two chapters of listening to God that he says, who am I to be questioning God? So because I haven't mentioned my daughter this morning, I'd like to talk about when, when, when children are young, how when you kind of correct them, either verbally or just with a little beep on the diaper, they, 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 they first they're like, wah, and then they're like, okay. There's like this peace that comes over them, like, meh, boundary, got it, thank you very much. This was going on here. He's like, Job, sit down and relax. And Job's like, okay, you're my dad. There's a reordering that God's trying to do for us in this season, church. He, he's allowed your brains to be scrambled. I just want you to know that. It, he, 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 where, where is God during this election? On his throne. Amen. <laughs> and, and everything that could be shaken will be shaken because then you will say, okay, God, I'm open to what you want now. Just like I preached to you last week, I give up. Let this fish vomit me back on the shore and I'll do what you say, God. Let me out of this constrained place because I'm ready to do what you say. And if you could understand 
everything that God has for you, it would explode your brain like an ant trying to understand the internet. And so there's some things you have to trust God for. And Job finally says, okay, okay, my knowledge is limited. I'm just a person, just a man. I can't see it all. And he stops questioning God. Job 42 says, then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do anything. No one can stop you. In other words, you're sovereign, you're omnipotent. He says, you ask, who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorance? This is this is Job having a little talk with himself now. It is I. I was talking about things I don't understand, things far too wonderful for me. I take back everything I said, and I sit in the dust and ashes to show you I've turned around. No, to show you my repentance. Same thing. That's what he says. I was talking about things way too big for me. I, I'm sorry. I repent. I trust you. So now, what do you do when you're in a situation when you cannot see the big picture, you cannot see everything, you just remind yourself about the things of God that you do know. Things you know for certain, that's what Job did. Job does it through the whole book. Things like this. I won't give you the scripture addresses. I'll just breeze through them for time. But he says, God, he's a loving and good God. He's all powerful. He notices every detail of my life. By the way, this isn't a Christian talking. This is Job, the oldest book of the Bible. An old, before he, there was a lot of these books written that he didn't have privy to. And he's talking like someone who should have the Holy Spirit living inside of them, should say things like, you notice every detail of my life. You're in control. You have a plan for my life. You will protect me. And he affirms in the middle of his doubts the things that he does know to be true. Friends, I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what you're gonna go through. I don't know what you're feeling right now as these words hit your heart. But I can tell you this. Our God, your God, is passionately and intimately aware of every single detail of your life and your situation, yours. Nothing misses his attention. And God also completely and totally loves you with an everlasting love. I, I like to remind myself that God didn't just love me, begin loving me on January 5th, 1970. Yes. No, he loved me from the beginning of time. The lamb was slain before the foundation of the earth. Talk about a gleam in your daddy's eye. He knows you. He, he was waiting for you to be born so he could love you in person. So he loves you with an everlasting love. And everlasting isn't like from the day you received him, February 3rd it, on. It, it, it is literally everlasting that way, everlasting that way. Remember the number line with two arrows? He's always loved you. And so we need to say to him, I know you're good. I know you're loving. I know you're powerful. I know that you know the details in my life. You're in control. I know that you have a plan for me. I know that you'll protect me. As I'm saying these things, church, I could feel goosebumps up my back. But will I say it when I don't feel them? After making all these affirmations, Job decides, I'm going to trust you no matter what. Job says this. Job says this. Joe is his name. His name's Joe now. <laughs> Job says... Job says this in 13. He says, though you slay me, I will trust in him. I guess you don't have that scripture, 13, 15. But he says it, turn to your King James. He says, though you slay me, I will trust you. And what he's saying is, I don't understand it all, but I'm gonna trust you. Yes. Have you come to that maturity where we can say, I don't get it, but I trust you? Do you realize, church, those of you that aren't saying come on like these two and that why they're saying it? They want to help me, but they're also helping themselves. Do you understand? They're verbally agreeing and they're committing to what God is saying in this place. Yeah. Get up, people, and say what God says. <laughs> God, I don't understand it all, but I know you're good. I know you died for me. I love the Catholic church in this respect. They got Jesus on that cross up there reminding me. I wonder if God loves me. Oh, yeah, thanks. Well, you can say what you want about them folks, but they you can say what you want, but I, I was just wondering if, if whoa, what's that? Oh, he died for me. 
If you have any questions, Jesus is up there like, I got this. Now, now, now live. I got this. Now live. Yeah, but Jesus, do, how much do you love me? Well, look at my hands. Remember the number line? It's going out in each direction. I loved you before. I loved you now. I loved you coming up. Lastly, this morning, the fifth key we can learn from Job's life. Refuse to become bitter. Deny the bitterness. Amen. Right, Leah? Amen. Deny the bitterness. So you can be bitter or you could be better. Right? You've heard it before. Bitterness is poison to your soul. That's why they call it bitterness. It ain't sweet. Job lost everything in his life in a single 24-hour period. Then he got this terrible illness, and here's what he says. I mean, he's lost it all. Job 121, Job says this. He says, I came naked from my mother's womb, and I shall have nothing when I die. You can't take it with you. The Lord gave me everything I have, and they were his to take away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all of this, Job did not sin by blaming God. His wife even said, curse Job and die. I mean, curse God and die. Now I got his name right. <laughs> his wife comes to him. What a great wife, huh, honey? Cursed God, guy, just curse God and die. That's not good advice, honey. Don't give me that. Thank God you don't. He's saying, don't get bitter. Grief is good, guys. Grief is the stairway. Grief is the tunnel into a new, fresh, lighted place. But, but pain's not going to kill you. Grief's not going to kill you. It's, grief is a process. But grief should have an expiration date on it at some point. And you should move out of that grief into something new. Resentment will destroy you. Bitterness will destroy you. Resentment is, is, is something you harbor. And, and it, it eats you up. It reinforces your pain. And it makes life worse. But grief is a good thing. Grief is like a cloud that comes into your life and let the water run down your cheeks. And then one day, like King David did when he cried over the first son that he lost, and then when it was over, he grieved, he shaved, he washed up, and he moved on. Grief is a good thing. Men, we don't handle grief too well. We like to push it down like that Coke bottle, push that pain down. We need to realize that grief's a tool and it's a gift from God to move us from one stage of loss into the next chapter. And so just, just think about it. Have you grieved over this thing? And it, 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 Many of you haven't. Maybe you need to. But many of you need to come out of it now. And we're going to pray for that in a minute. Jesus says, Blessed are they who are mourned, for they shall be comforted. If you don't mourn, you won't be comforted. I'm fine. I'm perfectly fine. I'm perfectly fine. Well, then don't be comforted. So God grieves. Did you know that? In John 11, we see Jesus wept. Jesus wept. Jesus had the perspective of eternity. He understood Lazarus was going to get up. He, he understood it all. He knew he was going to get up, right? And he still grieved. This is part of being a human. By the way, Christ was human. Fully human. I think about this a lot. Do you think God needed to become man like he did and die for your sin? Become man and feel everything you felt? So he go, oh, that, that, now I know what they're feeling like he didn't before. Did you ever think that the reason that God had to come to earth and die on a cross wasn't so he could be appeased just like some God that needs to throw a virgin in a volcano to feel better about himself? Maybe that's not the temperament of your father. Maybe that's not the temperament of our God. Maybe the reason that he had to die on a cross is so that you could see. Amen. You could see how much he loves me and you. Amen. I need to look at that. He loved me before he died on the cross. Yes. You need to come into the revelation, and I do too, that my flesh has been redeemed in him. He's, he doesn't despise us. And so we grieve because there's a proper time, Ecclesiastes says, for everything. Losses, they deepen you, but they do not define you. Loss does not define your life. Your divorce is not you. You are not your divorce. 
says. I don't care, Elizabeth Taylor, how many you got, God rest your soul. That's not who you are. You are a child of the living God. Your past may have deepened you and shaped you, but it's not who you are. Losses do not define you. Have we reached that kind of maturity that we realize that we're, we're not just what happened to us? That's what we're going to pray about today. And so there's a grace on every day. My last, as I begin to close now, there's a grace on every day. There's a grace for this Sunday. Yes. Now, worrying about things 12 days from now, you're, you're stealing, you're borrowing worries and pulling them into today. And today is one, we get 24 golden box cars every morning, every hour. And you can spend those any way you want. But you start borrowing against the future and worrying now, there's not grace for that. Wait till then. That's dumb to worry because when you worry, you're borrowing trouble. Because when you're carrying the weight of tomorrow, you're second guessing God. I heard this preacher say, <laughs> the Bible doesn't say, give us this day our monthly bread. <laughs> it's going to give you one day at a time. There's going to be enough strength. Yeah. Hebrews 2 says this, watch out that no bitterness take root among you. It causes deep trouble, hurting many in their spiritual lives. I want to talk to wives about that. Watch your bitterness. <gasps> he just called out women. Why women are more bitter? Women have an easier, no, men just do more. Give you reason to be bitter. They just do more to you. <laughs> it's been said many times in this life, pain is inevitable, but misery is optional. As I close now, I want to remind you th that we can face the future with courage. We can have the audacity to keep going. Look what it says in Job 11. It says, put your heart right, Job. Reach out to God. Put away evil and wrong from your home. Then face the world again, firm and courageous. Then all your troubles will fade from your memory like floods that are past and remembered no more. God, I love that visual. Like floods. You know when you're flooded with anger? When you're flooded with fear? When you're flooded with... He says, like floods then all your troubles will fade from your memory when you turn back to God and put your heart right. Like floods that are past and remembered no more, your life will be brighter than sunshine at noon and life's darkest hours will shine like the dawn and you will live secure and full of hope. Most of you in this room have experienced pain and loss. You know what I'm talking about. It's not the final chapter. Somebody can come play. It's not the final chapter. You're still alive. And that means the final chapter of your life has not, not been written yet. Someone told me recently, in the midst of this pandemic, somebody said to me, this is the best our life has ever been. Now, this is a person who has turned to God, someone who, who left behind some pain and grief. I'm sure it comes back but they're writing a new chapter of their life is what they explained to me. And, and this chapter's not over, you, you that have grieved. You say, I'm gonna get on with my life, I'm gonna face the future with courage. What would happen? What would happen if those of you that have been wounded, those of you that have been hurt, I don't care if it's last Thursday or 56 years ago, when that happened, what if you did this? What if you told God everything? You, it's on your heart. What if you allowed friends to come alongside you? What if you stopped asking why? And what if you trusted God with the stuff that doesn't make sense? And you said, no matter what happens, though you may slay me, I will trust you. Here's what will here's happen, Job 11. Life will be brighter. Beloved, what if that dark tunnel in your life, that darkest time was just a tunnel and you come in to the out, you come out of the tunnel into the brightest part of your life in this last season. Those of you that are going through a tunnel, you're going to come out on the other side. You just need to trust God. You need a savior. Get Christ off the cross and get him into your heart. 
So we're going to do two things now. We're going to pray together, and then we're going to have four, four or five of our prayer team come up there. And those of you that um, are not too proud to receive prayer, this is a time in the Lord. Last Wednesday, we had a prayer. Two Wednesdays ago, we had a prayer night. And I was playing the piano so that I could help the person who was speaking. And God said, go get prayer, pastor. Go get prayer. But they work for me. Go get prayer. Don't miss your moment. June and the rest of the prayer team, why don't you just come up here? Well, I'll pray first, and then you guys can come. I'm sorry. So this is the general prayer, and then after that, let's just take a few minutes, five minutes. Those of you who are free to leave, but those of you who are free to reach in and get prayer today. And I believe that there's a grace and a special, I don't want to say dispensation, but I just did. There's a special dispensing from the heavenly throne for grace today. Somebody wants to move on from their pain, and they don't know how. And they think they shouldn't be able to do it in their own strength. But you need a friend. You need one of us. Not because God can't do it, but because you haven't let him. So either in your chair right now or in the few moments after I pray, come on up and get some love because it's he's serving hot, fresh love today. Father, we thank you for your presence in this place. Oh, you are the king of glory. We open up to you. Come in now. This is how I feel, exactly how I feel. And I ask you to help me with these friends today in this place. God, you have trusted me with this church to love on these souls, to take their prayers before your throne. We can each go directly to you, but you have led me to pastor this church and I love these people and I lift them up to you right now and I commend them into your spirit under your wings and I say Father bring about healing bring about deliverance bring about new refreshing bring about finances marital strife come down anger be disintegrated now healing come hope Hope, hope, come back into a heart. Breathe life again. Breathe life again. In Jesus' name, over everybody listening and those on stream, receive what God is pouring out on you because He is here and He loves you with an everlasting love. This is your moment in God. Grab a hold of His love. Heal hearts. Heal minds, Lord Jesus. You are the King of glory. Come in. We pray all these things that you would give us the desires of our heart. We grab them by faith now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Marie and... Thanks for tuning in today. If you were blessed by this message at all, then be a blessing and give to the work of the Lord at eldoradochurch.org.